so you may know or you may not know that there are a number of tribunals that are associated with the Ontario Human Rights Commission, including the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal, and you may or may not know that they have been grouped, there's eight of them now, that have been grouped under the term social justice tribunals. And so that's what we have in Ontario. We have eight social justice tribunals, and these are extrajudicial organizations, and they, they can and do ruin your life. Now, I went and talked to a uh, top constitutional lawyer in Canada, one of the Canada's top constitutional lawyers, about two weeks after this all started, because I was, I was, I actually asked him about some libel that, that, that I thought I'd been subjected to because people were calling me racist because, I guess because I objected to the Black Liberation Collective. It's like, I don't care if you're, what your damn race is, if you're crazy and corrupt, I'm going to call you on it. And I think that's a pretty good definition of not being racist fundamentally. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say I'm race blind because I don't think anyone could say that, but you know, I do my best to be a decent person and to meet people one on one, and I think I'm pretty good at it. I mean, I've dealt with a lot of different people over the course of my life, a lot of them in my clinical practice and elsewhere. And, and I have 500 hours of YouTube videos online that about 2 million people have watched now, and you know, I'm sure people have been combing them over with a fine tooth comb trying to see if I've said anything that was vaguely inappropriate. And so far, <laughs> nobody's been able to call me on anything except, of course, these last videos. So, anyways, I told the university that after the second letter, which was an interesting letter, eh, because it's, so, it's been so interesting doing this, because one of the things that's happened is that at every opportunity, the people who have been opposing what I've been saying have been doing it in the most appalling manner that could possibly be hoped for. It's, been like, it's like being persecuted by the Three Stooges. Every time, they, every time they attempt to maneuver me into a corner, they do it so badly that it ends up exposing what they're doing. So that's what happened with the free speech rally, where the professional activists absolutely disgraced themselves, and so like four million people have watched that. And then, uh, and then the university did the same thing with this letter, you know, where they basically validated the claims I made in the video. I said, look, Looks to me like just making this video is illegal, which I thought was a problem. And not only that, in the policy it says, and this is something else you should pay attention to because this is a horrifying. If you're an employer in Ontario, you are liable for what your employees say just as if you said it. Even if the effects of their speech are, it doesn't matter whether the effects are intentional or unintentional, and it doesn't matter whether there's a complaint or not. So, so, so whatever the situation is, is that, well, you can figure that out for yourself. And you can go read the policy on the Ontario Human Rights Commission website. It's, it's there in black and white for everyone to see. It's so insane. And, you know, one of the things the social justice warriors are doing, and this is absolutely terrifying, and it's coming your way, believe me, is that they're rewriting the fundamental legal doctrines that govern, I would say, that, that govern our, our deepest legal um, um, rights. So, for example, in, 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 in the legal system, you're, you're guaranteed innocence until you're proven guilty, but in the new sexual harassment policies, for example, that are, that are being implemented at universities and producing what are essentially quasi-judicial bodies of inquiry at the universities, they've gone to preponderance of evidence, which basically means if the evidence suggests that you might have sexually harassed someone, then you did. So that's good. So you're, you're guilty to begin with until you're proved innocent and the standard is very, very low. And then the next thing they've done is wipe out intent. It's like if I say something to you and you get offended, what I meant is irrelevant. Think of that. It's crazy. It's completely crazy. And this is happening far faster than you think and in far more places than you think. So forget about what you think you said. Forget about when, what your intent was. It's like... If you say something to me and I get offended, I can take you to the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal. And today at the debate, they said, oh well, they probably won't throw you in jail. They had a lawyer there that said, well, that's probably what result in jail, which by the way, I think is absolute rubbish. And I looked into the law as much as I can. If I was fined and failed to pay the fine, they could hold me in contempt and put me in jail. And they already did that to someone in 2014. So that's rubbish. Well, so the punishment is there, and the punishment is profound. The constitutional lawyer that I went and talked to about being called in front of the Human Rights Tribunal said, 
He was rough on me, and he's a tough guy, and you would not like to have him on your case at a trial. Believe me, he's not agreeable from a trade perspective. He's a very <laughs> And he raped me over the coals and basically said, uh, Professor Peterson, said, you should shut the hell up and go back to your little life, because if they take you to the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal, it'll cost you $250,000, and you'll pay the legal fees of your opposition, and you will lose. And that's a hell of a thing for a top lawyer to tell you when you're thinking about uh, being, being hauled in front of one of these new kangaroo courts that have been foisted on us while we sleep in our ignorant slumber, not watching what's happening underneath our noses. So anyways, after the second letter, I talk, went and talked to the dean, in fact, about the sciences, who was one of the people who wrote the letter. He is a decent guy. You know, I would say he's a little too agreeable from a personality perspective. Uh, so he's even, I would say he's too easily pushed around, and he's too, he feels sorry for people too easily. And, you know, you think that's a virtue, but it's not. It's not a virtue. It's not a virtue. It's a temperamental proclivity at best. And feeling sorry for the wrong people just makes you naive. It makes you naive. And I'm, I'm telling you this technically. I have a lot of people in my clinical practice, a very common reason for people to come into my clinical practice, is because they need assertiveness training. They're too naive and they can't stand up for themselves. And so I train a lot of people in how to be more assertive. Basically what I treat, teach them to do is to be less compassionate, more honest. And you can tell if you're too compassionate because you're resentful. So you guys can all find out. It's like, are you resentful about things? It's because you're too agreeable. It means you're, you, you have some things to say and you're not bloody well saying them. And it's eating away at your soul. And so what I teach my clients who need to be less agreeable and more assertive so that they can do things like negotiate for higher wages, for example, and stand up for themselves is, look, see if you're resentful. There's only two reasons if you're resentful. One is that you should grow the hell up and take some responsibility and quit whining. And maybe you can talk to some people and find out if that's your problem. And the second one is, you're getting oppressed and you have something to say. And you know that. You know you do it. And you have to learn how to stand up and articulate yourself. So I teach people that sort of thing all the time. I think David Cameron is a little bit too on the agreeable side. Anyways, I went and talked to him and I said, look, I said, oh, you sent me this letter, but hundreds of thousands of people have watched this video now and it's got immense press attention. Maybe there's an issue here. <laughs> and so I said, well, why don't, we, why don't we have a debate? You know, why don't we have a debate? Why don't we model at the University of Toronto how a civilized discussion about these topics might be held because there's things to talk about here. You know, one of the things I thought about while I was doing this is, uh, you know what you call people you can't talk to? Enemies. <laughs> right. And we should think about that. We look at how polarized the United States is. It's not good. And things can flip very badly in very short periods of time. And when people stop talking, and I, I think that's what's happened, the political dialogue in some senses has come to a halt. And, and the Americans in particular have, are, have divided themselves up into two increasingly distant camps. It's not good. It's not good. And you know what happens in the United States just happens here ten years later. So, so we can look down there and think, well, it's heading our way. And I can certainly see this. The Canadian campuses aren't anywhere near as politically correct as the American campuses, but it's just because we're slow. It's not because, we're, because we do things better. <laughs> Anyways, to their credit, the university agreed to host the debate, and that was today. And so you can watch that online if you want. I'll put up an edited version of it on my website, which or my YouTube channel, which is Jordan Peterson Videos. That happened today, and it was at that debate that I got denounced, I would say, uh, by the, the sort of social justice warrior who's exactly the sort of person who would like to denounce you. And they also accused me of spreading hate propaganda. It's another thing that you should think about because. You know, even reasonable people can have a discussion about what constitutes reasonable limitations on free speech. You know, you say, well, you shouldn't be allowed to hate. It's like, first of all, that's not so obvious to me. So I've had clients who had plenty of reason to hate, and the reasons were valid, and sometimes you have reasons to hate that are associated with the demand for justice. Now, that's a hell of a lot different than hating people because of their ethnic or racial identity, which is, you know, to say the least, counterproductive. Um, but the problem with, with, with the, the argument even that freedom of speech should be regulated to, to reduce hate speech is that who the hell gets to define hate? 
Exactly. And you know, let's say let's say you were smart and you set up a little committee, exactly. like they just set up in New York, by the way, right? Because now they have a anti bias hotline in New York State. They've hired 50 policemen to police it. And so if you think you've been the victim, say, of a, a, a biased perception that was even unintentional on the part of the speaker, you can call the anti-racism bias team and they will come and investigate. And that's happening all over campuses, by the way, all over university campuses, all over North America. Now the problem is, it's like, let's say we could find five people who were smart enough to define hate. Right, and they were smart. They were carefully selected, wise people. So like then we grant them that power. Well, then we have a problem because now we've localized that power. And even if those five people are going to be very judicious and careful with it, you can bloody well be sure that the people who replace them will be nothing of the sort because those sorts of positions attract exactly the sort of people that you do not want occupying those sorts of positions. And so the way that you keep hate speech under control is you let the idiot haters out in public where they can babble mindlessly about their foolishness and get shredded by public opinion. And it has to be distributed among the public because otherwise you have to give someone the power to regulate the damn speech and as soon as you do that, you are screwed. <laughs> and that's basically where we are. And well, the debate happened today and, and uh, I can't tell how it went, although the people who watched it, although of course the people who talked to me about it were on my side, so you think it went quite well, and I'm hoping that it did, and I'll, I'll watch it and make my own conclusions, but at least the bloody debate happened. But it was a small satisfaction to me, and that's partly because it was obvious, even by the way the debate was set up, that I was fighting a rearguard action against something that's already occurred, and the universities have been taken over by politically correct authoritarians to the point where I think, I don't think they're redeemable. What I would do, and I've been thinking, how the hell would you address this? This is what I think should happen. Um, I think that the government should cut funding to universities by 25% and force no tuition increase. And I think they should make the faculty and administration cannibalize each other until the only people left are the people that are important. Because I think the universities <laughs> And I'm saying this as a great admirer of universities, truly, um, and I, I say this with true sorrow, that I truly believe that the universities now do more harm than good, and that they are breeding grounds for fifth columnist activists who, who, do, who, who are profoundly opposed to all of the virtues that made Western civilization, who are so opposed to those virtues that they would be appalled to hear me claim that they were even virtues. And I would say that that was on full display today at the debate. Um, and, and if you don't believe me, it's fine. I don't want you to believe me. I've never wanted anyone to believe me, for God's sake. You know, it would be so I tell my students, well, I've got to tell you some things. They're outrageous. Think about them. If you can see any holes in them, if you can see any flaws in them, well, tell me what they are. Because I've been thinking about this stuff for 30 years, and I can't poke any holes in it. So if you can do it, like, have at it, because I'd sure like to know. So, well, with regards to the, to the university situation, 